than a wicked and hip hop. Bad, bad, and a wicked and Okay, I think uh, let's get started today. We actually have a lot to discuss today, all right? <laughs> so first again, uh, the administrative stuff. Um, project two is uh, due tomorrow, right? We, we, talk about, we have mentioned this extension on Piazza. Uh, so one thing I need to emphasize today is that, uh, like we have mentioned in our Piazza post, we actually uh, update our uh, grading scripts, and especially uh, we have included the uh, formatting and client ID and those style checks in our greeting scripts as well. So uh, my colleague, uh, Andrew, he reran your oil submissions last night. He actually, I think, mentioned to me that uh, more than, oh, not more than, but nearly half of the submissions actually failed the uh, uh, formatting and style check. So you should definitely uh, double check on grid scope if you have already submitted a project two and see uh, whether your formatting and styling is uh, passing or not. Uh, hopefully, even though it's not passing, it's not, uh, I mean, it's just fixed, uh, fixed uh, formatting. Hopefully, it should not be uh, too bad. But again, it's uh, due uh, tomorrow night. And then for project three, we'll release that uh, today, right? It's also postponed a little bit, but we'll uh, keep the due date as uh, November the 14th. And lastly, uh, we'll release the homework uh, for uh, next week, and it will be due in November as well. Okay? <laughs> So I actually don't know whether we have advertised these uh, talks in this uh, class before, but essentially, uh, I mean, our database group at CMU are also uh, hosting uh, database seminars every week, where we just invite uh, outside uh, database practitioners from various companies, like either big companies or small startups, uh, to talk about, I mean, database techniques, right, to work that, that, uh, that they are building uh, in the wild. So next week, the, our database seminar, and I will include the link in our slides, it's actually uh, from a startup called uh, Trino uh, that is like doing a kind of like a federated database engine, but actually essentially, especially going to talk about uh, their optimizer and the challenges and their solutions that, that they faced uh, when they are building their optimizer. So it's actually very aligned with our topics, uh, these lectures. If you are interested, um, you could just check it out, how our uh, query optimization theory would actually be uh, applied or something would may even be, br be broken uh, in practice. I'm pretty looking forward to that. All right. So that's the uh, administrative stuff. Uh, in terms of the content today, uh, we are st just still going to uh, talk about uh, the query optimization and, and planning technique in a database system. So again, this is arguably uh, the most uh, difficult part uh, of a database system. And then uh, again, we have a lot to uh, cover today, actually. So uh, just a little bit of recap. Last week, we talked about uh, simple heuristics or rules that we can apply uh, to rewrite our uh, logical query operator trees right, so that we can generate some preferred query plan as early as possible such that we can reduce the search space that we need to ex explore uh, during our uh, like, uh, plan enumeration or cost based uh, search phase. And then today, we're going to uh, go deeper into the second part of cost based page cost-based search uh, phase uh, that, that we can enumerate uh, more complicated query plans and generate uh, better alternatives or, or like optimal, or potentially optimal alternatives. So again, there are two parts of this uh, cost-based query optimization process. The first part is that we need a cost model so that we can estimate uh, the uh, potential cost of executing a query plan without executing it, right, obviously. And the second part is that we are going to use that cost model as our guide in a search process so that we can uh, compare the cost and benefit of different alternatives or the query plans and then uh, pick the better one, right? So it's a cost model and then there's a search process. And uh, today's agenda, last week we, I gave a little bit of heads up on the cost model and today we are going to talk a little bit more about how we are going to uh, uh, complete uh, this uh, cost model and then I'm going to talk about the plan enumeration part as a second part of this lecture. So again, just a quick recap. For the cost model, we talk about uh, three possible uh, components of the cost model. The first is that what would be uh, the factors that would affect the cost of a plan execution related to the hardware, so like a CPU, a disk, a memory, et cetera, et cetera. And again, uh, these uh, factors related to uh, physical properties 
would be primarily considered in uh, commercial systems, right? So in open source systems, um, pretty much not considered except some uh, important factors like uh, the cost between memory access versus uh, disk access or the cost uh, com between uh, or cost difference between uh, sequential I.O. and random I.O., right? For open source system, that's pretty much that. And the second, logical cost, I mean, pretty much everyone needs to consider, which would just essentially means that the number of two pods each operator needs to process, I mean, in, inside uh, their query plan tree. Right? That includes both how many two pods would be fed into the, each operator as well as how many uh, two pods would come out of the operator, essentially your result size. And lastly, just the, the algorithmic cost, I mean, let's say you want to sort some data, then uh, the algorithmic cost for sorting will just be n log n, right, for other operators as well. So last week we talk, also talked about uh, Postgres and DB2, right, there's two examples of a open source system and a commercial system of how they uh, use their, uh, how, to, how to build their cost model. But an important part that we haven't talked about I mean, we, of course, for the algorithmic cost, that's kind of straightforward, right? Cost of sorting, cost of building a hash table, we covered that in our uh, earlier lectures uh, this semester. But then the important part we haven't talked about is the second logical cost, right? How do we actually going to know how many tuples are we going to process? Especially while you are processing or executing the query alongside your um, query plan tree, you are going to uh, execute different operators, right? The number of input and output for each operator during the uh, plan tree could actually be different. And if you don't know how many tuples you need to process, then none of these uh, cost model components we talk about would make sense, right? Because if you only know the complexity, I mean, then I mean, you, can, you cannot estimate the cost anyway. So today, we're just going to talk about how are we going to uh, estimate the second logical cost, especially the number of tuples each operator need to process. And for this, what we are going to primarily rely on is something uh, called statistics inside the database system. So in, in, in database system, statistics are, so the term statistics are specifically referring the property of the data stored uh, in the tables of a database system. That could include uh, how many tuples in each table, or what would be the number of distinct values, et cetera, et cetera, right? So statistics, is specifically referred to the data property in a database system. It could have other meanings uh, in other uh, uh, topics right, or areas. So uh, one thing uh, is, no, is should be uh, remindful is that because I mean database may have uh, lots of tables, right? Each table may have uh, lots of attributes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, it would oftentimes be costly to uh, compute those statistics. So what database system typically do is that instead of while or before you execute a query, calculate the statistic on fly, instead of doing that, your database system would actually have um, special commands right, that you can execute to calculate the statistics for all the tables and attributes uh, ahead of time and then store them in uh, its internal tables. Right? These commands could be uh, I mean, the command itself could be different among different systems. Like in Postgres or SQLite, it's analyze. In SQL Server, it's update statistics, etc. But at the end of the day, they pretty much do the same same thing. It's just a pre-compute all the statistics you need um, to uh, guide the uh, cost estimation of the cost model. And a different system would actually handle uh, the invocation of this command to generate statistics a little bit differently. Um, most of the time, that actually is actually required from the users or database administrators to issue this command to the database system, right? At the best time uh, that the users or developers uh, deem uh, to be suitable. So, I mean, after you invoke this command, the system will generate statistics and store it. But uh, in some systems, right, not, not that often, but in some cases, the system may uh, automatically generate the statistics uh, at, uh, when the system uh, workload, the workload volume is low. Right. Uh, I think, for example, Oracle, they may have an option to, I mean, automatic, uh, automatically generate statistics every night, like after 12 p.m. or 12 a.m. or something like that. Right. And some other system, like a piggy, uh, Postgres, it may actually uh, piggyback on um, uh, other background maintenance tasks uh, to generate statistics. I mean, without even uh, you notify them. But that's um, that's less common. Okay. <laughs> so uh, to uh, just uh, define the the uh, different statistics that a database system may use to help the later cost estimation. <laughs> Here in these slides, I'm going to uh, define the, the two most basic statistics first. I mean, then 
I mean, the first one is just uh, for every relation R, the database system will re just maintain the number of tuples right, in the relation R, and then we denote that as uh, NR, right? That's very straightforward, how many tuples in the table. And the second is that what would be the number of distinct values for each attribute uh, in the table, right? Let's say the table has three attributes A, B, C, then we'll have V, um, A, R, V, B, R, and V, C, R, etc., to denote the number of distinct values uh, in each table. And again, that's the two most basic statistics, and we'll have other advanced statistics as well. I'd like to give you some high-level uh, examples of how useful these statistics would be. For example, the number of tuples, well, you may need that uh, to estimate the cost of a sequential scan, right? If you want to read the entire table, what would be the cost of that? You need that information to do the estimation. And for the number of distinct values, uh, for example, if your query has a select distinct, right, the number of distinct values will directly tell you, hey, what's the output size? Uh, well, assuming that there's no other predicates. Uh, but even, uh, even uh, other than that, the, it, the number of distinct values could also be uh, useful in the cases that you have a hash join operation. Right? Then you want to know what would we possibly be the size of the hash table, et cetera. Right? So this statistic may also help. Okay, we'll get into more details later, but right now I'll just give you a heads up. And then the next uh, derived statistics we are going to talk about is called a selection cardinality. And this is just nothing more than you divide the number of tuples NR in a table by the number of distinct values, right, VAR, if you're assuming uh, you are looking at a property or attribute A. So essentially, this statistic just represents the uh, average number of records of, with a given value uh, for an attribute, right? Make sense? Just a, a simple division, and this is uh, derived statistics. <laughs> so uh, maybe, you, maybe you have already noticed that when we uh, calculate the, this uh, average number of records for a given value of a given attribute this way, we are making a huge assumption here, right? We are just essentially assuming that the data is uh, uniformly distributed. Uh, for every uh, single uh, value in this attribute, they all have the same number of records. And of course, this is not, uh, in, in practice, many data sets, uh, or probably most of the case, this is, this is, this is not true. Right? I mean, it's very rare that you have an exact uniform distribution. Um, but again, uh, just uh, to uh, simplify uh, our calculation and to simplify our overall query optimization process, we are making uh, this assumption right, to, to generate uh, better query plans in time, right? so instead of figuring some complicated uh, relationship between different properties forever. Right? And uh, again, like I give you a simple example, assuming that uh, there are 10,000 students, I mean, in, in, in CMU, right? Assuming there are 10 different colleges, right? The actual number probably more than that. Then in this case, the uh, select, selection cardinality for uh, a each attribute uh, in this, uh, in this uh, well, for the attribute college in our uh, data set will just be uh, 1,000, right? Assuming that each college have the same number of students. In actuality, this is probably not true, but that's the assumption that we're going to hold uh, in most cases to simplify our lives. Okay, <laughs> so uh, loop back to what I talked about earlier, right? So the primary goal of these uh, statistics is to help calculate uh, the uh, logical cost uh, in our database system, right? So that eventually we can do a cost estimation in our uh, query optimization. So, but in some cases, right, in some, I would remind that in some uh, simple cases, you may actually need the complicated statistics, right? So uh, for example, assuming uh, here's a case, right, you, are, have a, you have a simple select query on the uh, primary key uh, in, a, in a table called people, right, called people, and then you just uh, select uh, everything from this table uh, with a equality predicate on the primary key. Then, in this case, you actually don't need those statistics, right? And because it's a primary key, then at the most, you can only have a one uh, tuple that, that would be matched. And in that case, uh, the estimation is easy. But in, in most other cases, right, let's say you have a range query or you have a, um, I don't know, so have a predicate with a string value that needs to be matched with a wildcard, et cetera, then in most cases, uh, you need uh, statistics to help you decide how many tuples you are, the, you are going to get uh, in each operator, okay? So uh, again, to give you a little bit more uh, formal definition, so the, 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 um, we are going to formally define 
the uh, number of tuples or, or actually the fraction of tuples we are going to get after each operator as the uh, selectivity of, 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 of this uh, predicate or this operator. So which means that say uh, you have a operator that is uh, going to uh, scan a, a, a table but with a predicate that would uh, select uh, 10 attributes out of a table of 100 records, then the selectivity of this uh, operator or this predicate will just be uh, 0 0.1, right? Because you, for this operation, you are going to look at 10% of the total data you have in the table, right? That's just, a, that's just a term we use. And then, of course, for different predicates, different situations, you will have a different formula uh, to compute such selectivity, which we are going to uh, details uh, right now, okay? Terminologies are clear? Okay. <laughs> okay, so now uh, give you, uh, I mean, a little bit more uh, concrete example, right? Assuming that uh, we have uh, this uh, table, right, with uh, five distinct values on uh, this uh, attribute age, right? And then the total number of uh, tuples in this table will also be five, right? Uh, don't think of this as like this age as um, concrete value, just think of them as like a younger age group, older age group, et cetera, right? So assuming that we have a table with uh, five uh, age groups, and then they are actually exactly uh, five tuple with different age groups, right? So uh, if we apply uh, this predicate, right, this, this query, select star from table where age uh, equals two, then the selectivity will just be uh, the uh, number of tuples satisfy this divided by the total number of uh, tuples, right? So uh, in this case, again, I, we, as I show here, I mean, the, 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 the table has uh, five age groups and then each of them has one tuple. Then the selectivity uh, of this um, uh, query with age group, with age equals two or age group equals two will just be uh, one fifth. Make sense? All right. So to give you another example, right, let's say now we have a little bit more complex query, right? Instead of looking exactly at age group equals two, we are looking at, hey, what if uh, I want to select tables with age greater than equal, greater or equal than two, right? Then we'll just look at uh, these uh, three tuples in this query, and then uh, the selectivity of this uh, query, right, would just be uh, three uh, divided by uh, five. And then again, the formula for this would be, uh, I mean, I can read this out to you, would be, uh, uh, select something if a is greater or equal to uh, than small a, then the selectivity we are going to calculate will just be uh, a max minus than small a plus one divided by a max minus a min plus one. Right? Just uh, again, this only works assume that data are uniformly distributed, and then you can calculate the selectivity this way. Lastly, uh, how do we calculate the selectivity if there's a negation predicate? Well, that's kind of, actually, that's kind of straightforward, right? Essentially, you will first calculate the selectivity without the negation, right? And then you just use a one minus that as selectivity, okay? So again, if you want to calculate the selectivity of age, age, age group not equal to two, then you will first calculate the selectivity with age equal to two, and then you just do a one minus that, right? So that would just be a four fifth, all right? Does it all make sense? Okay. <laughs> so one observation so far we can probably have is that the way we calculate the selectivities is essentially similar to uh, what we learn from uh, basic statistics or probability uh, theory. Right? Essentially, we're just looking at, hey, what is the probability that a certain tuple is going to be certified, satisfy my predicate in this table, right? So with that observation, we can actually borrow many uh, similar concepts from uh, statistics 101 or probabilistic theory that help us to calculate uh, these, uh, these uh, selectivities, especially with the more complicated uh, predica predicates, okay? So here, for example, assuming that we have a conjunction predicate now, right? So not only, I mean, not, not only that we could look at a single predicate, look at even one attribute, look at only one attribute with a, with a property. Now, now, let's say we are looking at, we are trying to figure out the selectivity for a predicate with a P1 a conjunction by P2, right? So again, assuming that the predicates, predicates are independent, right, which is another assumption we made to simplify our life, then using the uh, basic uh, statistical uh, uh, I mean, 
technique, we can just uh, simply multiply, multiply the selectivity of these approved predicates together right, to, so to, to be the uh, selectivity estimation of this uh, conjunction predicate. I mean, this is a, just a recurring thing that we are making uh, many assumptions that could just break in practice. But again, for to make the query optimization problem tractable and efficient so that you can generate a query plan in time instead of taking forever, uh, we are making these assumptions just as a trade-off. Okay, yeah, this is ensuring you've timed that. And then the, this part, it would be the selectivity for the uh, conjunction predicate. Then for disjunction, and, uh, and again, I probably won't uh, repeat uh, this, uh, this recruiting here, but essentially uh, you are just uh, going to treat it uh, as the, uh, well, it, it, essentially that's how you calculate the uh, all uh, operation in a predicate, right? So uh, again, I, I assume uh, this is like a master level slash upper level undergrad course, I'll just uh, skip the equation here. All right. <laughs> So uh, next, with this uh, ability to uh, calculate the selectivity of the number of tuples for our predicates with a basic scan, so what other information we need uh, to calculate uh, or to estimate the cost of a query? Well, there are many queries that would, con would contain multiple relations and which essentially would contain a join operator, right? So uh, in this case, we need to operate how many tuples would come out from a join operation. And uh, essentially, in other words, the question is that for a given uh, tuple in a relation R, right, assuming that we are join, joining R and S, then for a given tuple in a relation R, how many tuples of the other relation S will find it to be uh, matched? So here, another assumption that we're making, which is that we are going, just going to assume that for every key in the inner relation, which would be uh, R in this case, there will exist at least one key uh, in the outer relation S that would just match. Right? So, uh, Obviously, again, in many cases, this, this won't hold, but I mean, to make the problem tractable or calculatable, right, we just have to make this assumption. And I would say, in, in actuality, in, in, many, in many cases, would, this would actually uh, hold. And especially when you are joining two tables, and then there will be a foreign key constraint on one table towards the other, right? That's, that's some, in many cases, that's, how, that's when you are going to perform a join. And if that's the case, this, pro this assumption would actually be uh, satisfied. But again, in, my, in many other cases, it won't. So uh, what would be the uh, formula here? Well, essentially, I mean, to define it more formally, we are assuming that uh, we are joining a relation R and S, and we also assume that we only have a one join predicate, right? Essentially, they are, uh, when we will, uh, I mean, calculate, uh, we will look at the, uh, the overlap between the columns in R and the columns in S, there would only be one column overlap, right? And, and that is, a, uh, and, and that is uh, the joint predicate we are going to look at. And also we are going to assume that this uh, joint predicate is not on a primary key column, because otherwise it will be much easier, right? Because every, every key is unique. And in that case, it's uh, straightforward to know what would be the maximum size that is possible, right? Okay, then what we are going to do here, and again, be mindful of our assumption earlier, which is that for every tuple in the inner relation R, there will be a one tuple that will be matched in S. So what we do here essentially is just that we are going to time the number of tuples in R, right, in this case NR, with the selection cardinality of S, right? So here I just expanded it to be the division between the number of tuples divided by, and the number of distinct values. But essentially, the right-hand side of this formula, NS, divided by a VAS, essentially the select, a selection cardinality, right? Which will be the average number of records for each value in table S, right? So we're just going to multiply these two together. But that is not the best we can do, actually, because if we are going to join uh, uh, R and S, then we will actually get, get, get the same number of tuples, assuming inner join, okay? Then we are going to get the same number of tuples when we join R and S, as when we join S and R, right? So what we, a simple, uh, thing we can do to make this estimation a little bit more accurate, which is that we can flip the order, right? We can also estimate, hey, assuming that if we are joining S to R, then what would be the number of tuples, right? This, this, then this would be a completely the reverse, right? So uh, we will just uh, use the second equation here. And then, I mean, for, since I mean, these uh, two join, right, they are symmetric, they will have the same number of tuples, then uh, for this uh, join operation, it can have at most, I mean, it, it cannot have more tuples than the estimation of, uh, of, of one of these estimations, right? So uh, essentially, we are just going to uh, 
divide uh, this uh, uh, multiplication by the maximum uh, number of uh, distinct values in each table. Right? So essentially, on the other words, we are taking a minimum on the two estimations as the final estimation on this drawn operation. Okay, does this uh, make sense? Any questions for estimating drawing select selectivity? All make sense? Okay, sounds good. To recap the, uh, all the assumptions we have made, right? the first, we have made the assumption that the data is uniform, such that we can estimate the uh, selection cardinality, which means that the average number of records of uh, each tuple, right? because otherwise we cannot estimate that. The second, when we calculate uh, the uh, selectivity for uh, sequential scans or index scan, right? same thing, but for scans with the predicates, we are going to assume that different clauses in these predicates are independent, right? so that we can use a probabilistic theory to directly times them together as the estimation. And then lastly, when we are calculating the uh, selectivity for joins, we are assuming this uh, inclusion principle, which means that for every tuple in the inner table, sorry, inner join, we are, inner relation, we are going to find a match in the outer relation. And then, of course, in many cases, these assumptions, like I mentioned, would break. So let me uh, give you a few, just two examples of when these things will, will break, and then how uh, potentially we may fix it. But, but when I say potential, because even though there are some methods to cope with that, but we are not going to uh, fix it perfectly, right? Because it's just challenging. Uh, and in most of the cases, we are still making these assumptions. Okay. First, is about the uh, independent assumption. Right? So uh, one uh, case uh, that in this independent uh, assumption would be broken is that you have uh, correlated attributes. Right? So uh, assuming that you have a data set of automobiles, and then assuming that you have uh, 10 different makes of cars, and then 100 models of the cars. And then assuming that you are trying to uh, execute a query with the following predicate, right? You are trying to find, hey, all the, what, we, what are my records with the make of the car is Honda, as well as the uh, model of the car is a car. Then if you use uh, the earlier uh, equation, a uh, selectivity equation we talk about assuming independence, then you will just uh, multiply the, uh, the I mean, uh, the selectivity for Honda by the selectivity of a chord, which would be uh, 0.001, right? But we, as human in actuality, we know that only Honda, I mean, produce a chord, right? There's no, I mean, no major, other major uh, automobile uh, makers would actually produce a car model called a chord. So in that case, we actually know that the real selectivity of a chord is just 0 0.01, right? Because there are 100 uh, models in total and there's only one chord. So in this case, uh, this uh, selectivity would just be uh, broken, right? So what would be uh, the uh, some uh, potential? Uh, actually, oh, actually, yeah. So what would be uh, the uh, some uh, potential ways to fix this? Well, then you can actually uh, define a correlated uh, column statistics on multiple attributes in a database, right? So a little bit similar to how we define the statistics, number of values, number of distinct values on one attribute in a table. You can actually define a number of tuples and you assess the, as well as the number of distinct combination of like, the value pairs on two or three or more attributes. Right? And, and then if you have that, then in this case, you can directly use um, the uh, two column uh, statistics to estimate the selectivity of this predicate. But as you can see that there are many different possible um, predicate, oh sorry, attribute combinations in a table, right? So it's actually, uh, I think it's uh, exponential. Then uh, you obviously you cannot define correlated attributes statistics on every combination of attributes. So what would the database system uh, do in this case? Well, typically, that's just the offload to the users, right? The users or database administrators would actually need to tell the database system that, hey, I know that in my data set, there will be two or three attributes that are correlated, and then in my workload, there may be some query that are querying uh, those attributes together. So that you need to define uh, multiple uh, column or multiple attribute uh, statistics on these combinations, and then the system can use that because it's, it's a bit difficult. Even though some system, I think some system are trying to do that, but in the most cases, it's difficult to figure that out automatically because the combination is just too many, okay? <laughs> okay, then uh, the other assumption we have made earlier, which would be uh, the uniform uh, distributed assumption, right? So again, assuming that uh, uh, this, we have uh, this table, right, with uh, 15 uh, values, right? Then here, when we have uh, the uh, data, every 
value have uh, the same number of occurrences, occurrences then our uh, selection cardinality estimation would be uh, perfect, right? But in practice, oftentimes, the uh, number of occurrences of each value in the table would not be uniformly distributed, right? So here, is giving you an example of this. <laughs> and, and in this case, one simple thing we can do is that, or naive thing we can do is that, instead of uh, recording the average, I mean, the total number of distinct values, or the one number uh, called a selection cardinality, a naive thing is just to record the occurrence of each single value, right? But then the obvious problem is that this can become pretty large, right? So assuming that uh, you have this, just these um, 15 k keys, and then assuming that you are use a 32-bit integer to remember the uh, value of each, or to remember the number of occurrences of each value, then with just these 15 values, you already need to spend 60 bytes to record all the occurrences values, right? Then assuming that you have a table, right? In this area, I mean, it's, it's not that uncommon to have a table, a super large table with um, with a billions of rows, right? So assuming that you have a table with a billion row, then 32 bits uh, per, per, per value or per row will just be end up to be uh, four gigabytes of data, right? For a table with a billion values. So uh, assuming that the table may have, I don't know, tens or even more than 100 attributes, then that's just an uh, overhead that is uh, not affordable. So to be a little bit smarter, right, to be a little bit, if we want to estimate uh, the number of values for each attribute or occurrences uh, for each value uh, in the attributes more accurately, accurately, but then we don't want to pay this huge overhead, one thing that a little bit smarter we can do is that instead of keep track of the occurrence of each single value, we can track the occurrence of multiple values together to amortize the cost, right? So in other words, um, that's the standard term uh, for this kind of uh, data structure that to track these values will be called histogram. So here, I mean, very simple. Here, assuming that we are going to uh, track the occurrence of every three values together. Right. In this case, we'll just, uh, I mean, the standard term uh, for these um, groups of values would be called a bucket, and then each bucket would just have a range of three. So we are just going to look at each bucket and calculate what would be the total number of occurrences of values within each bucket. And then when we need to uh, calculate the uh, number of uh, occurrence of a particular value, we're just going to first locate which bucket it exists, and then we're just going to divide by the um, value recorded for that bucket, by the number of, I mean, uh, for some number of elements uh, in that bucket. Right? For example, here, in this case, uh, if we look at the last bu bucket, uh, if we want to, say, calculate uh, the number of um, occurrences for the value 14, then we are just going to divide the count 14, right, by the total number of elements 3 in this bucket. That would be um, almost 5, right? And this would be uh, less costly, but of course it's going to be uh, less accurate because, I mean, the uh, number of occurrences of all the values in this bucket may still be different, right? Here, if we go back to the earlier example, the, uh, the number of uh, occurrences for 14 will probably be uh, correct, right? But then for 13 or 15, it's actually uh, incorrect, right? So, uh, for example, for 15, the, the number of occurrences is almost 10, but we are still going to estimate to be uh, just a little bit below 5. So in this case, an um, optimization uh, you can do here is that instead of uh, divide this uh, total amount of values into buckets by uh, just uh, the number of, a number of values, I mean, you are going to count, what we can do is that we can group these values based on the number of occurrences, right? So essentially what we are trying to do here is that we are trying to divide uh, these values into buckets such that the total number of occurrences in each bucket will be uh, almost the same, right? So in this case, uh, we are hoping that there will be a less difference in the uh, number of occurrences of values in each bucket, and then uh, the value would be a little bit more accurate, right? So here, in this case, instead of uh, have the um, every bucket to be uh, covering uh, three elements, that would be called uh, equal uh, width earlier, right? We are here, we are doing that for every bucket, we are, they are going to cover roughly uh, 10 occurrences, right? And, and this could have a uh, I mean, different number of values uh, actually in each bucket. And then, uh, that's, in this case, uh, the histogram would be called equal uh, equi-depth histogram. And to take our earlier example, 
uh, that we have looked at. In this case, if we look at the last bucket, right, then the number of total occurrences in this bucket will be a 14, uh, sorry, would be a 12, but then there will only be two elements in this bucket, right? So in this case, we are just going to estimate the uh, number of occurrence for both 14 and 15 as six, right? Which is um, I mean, a little bit more accurate than what we uh, have before, especially for the value of 15. Okay, so this will be uh, again showing you the number of uh, values in each uh, in each um, bucket. Okay, that's the uh, two optimization uh, we uh, talk about that potentially deal with uh, the assumptions that uh, may uh, break earlier. Any uh, questions so far? Yes, please. Yes, so uh, the histogram calculation usually don't directly uh, affect the number of uh, tuples when we calculate the that for the join. So usually uh, where this histogram would be uh, useful is on the predicates, right? So either you have a, I mean, equity predicate, right, like I discussed earlier, or you have a range predicate it will use. So for joins, typically it's still the, the same equation. Okay, so uh, I will talk about most of the uh, common approaches uh, to uh, maintain statistics for the attributes in the table, right? There are, <laughs> there are simple ones like um, number of tuples, distinct values, and the histogram would be a little bit uh, more complex, but then still uh, used in uh, some systems. Uh, now I'm just going to talk about some uh, less common ones, right? So the ones I talked about earlier, they are more like straightforward to compute, uh, easier to maintain. And for example, the Postgres used uh, just used the histogram uh, one, as far as I remember, right? For the later ones, uh, including the sketches, as well as a sample technique I will talk about, uh, these are a little bit more complex, right? Require more uh, cost to um, calculate it, to, to generate it, as well as require some overhead to maintain it as well. Right, so, and, and when you're trying to use them, uh, it may also be a little bit more costly than the straightforward I mean, formula we talked about earlier. So uh, these two techniques would be less common, but you know, somebody, uh, some, some people would use it uh, if that is su that's suitable for their, for, their, uh, for their goal. And the first I'm gonna talk about here is called uh, sketches. So I don't know whether uh, Andrew has covered a balloon filter earlier in the semester, but uh, yeah, if we cover it, it's essentially a very similar thing. Right, so balloon filter, you have a probabilistic data structure to identify whether a value exists, I mean, in your data set. Here, again, you are just going to use a, a probabilistic data structure. Actually, some implementation would have, uh, would share a similar intuition as well, but, but again, it's a, a probabilistic data structure that, that you can maintain uh, that uh, to estimate the occurrence of each individual value. And since it's a probabilistic structure, and obviously you can imagine that there would be a trade-off between how big this data structure is versus how accurate the estimation uh, would, can, can be, right? So there's a trade-off. Either the developers or the users uh, have to uh, balance. Uh, so it's not as easy to use as the earlier simple techniques. And the uh, most common two examples of this would be uh, Contmin sketch and hyperloglog, log, which I, I probably, uh, I wouldn't go into details in this class. And the next, uh, another option uh, to uh, do estimation, again, less common, is to do a sampling, right? So instead of say, hey, maintain these different data, histogram, sketches, or whatever about, uh, the, about the property of the data, why not I just keep certain samples of the data, right? And then when a query comes, I just look at the samples in my data set, sorry, the samples I reserved for my data set and see, hey, how many tuples satisfy a certain predicate or property in the sample and then extrapolate from there, right? So here I'm giving you an example. Say we have a table that is uh, selecting uh, the uh, average age from a table called, uh, called uh, people, but I want to only look at the table with age group greater than 50, right? <laughs> so the so assuming that this table has is really, really big, it has a billion tuples, I'm showing you a fraction of that. What we can do is that we can keep a certain number of samples in this tuple, sorry, in this table, and assuming here that we are keeping uh, three samples here, right? So when this query, uh, when we are trying to execute this query, and then cost uh, the, to estimate the uh, execution cost of this query with our cost model, which is going to look at uh, this sample table to see how many tuple satisfy uh, this predicate, which would be uh, one uh, out of the three in this case, right? And then we are just going to use that 
as the selectivity estimation uh, for us in our cost model. And we times uh, this one third with the bidding uh, to estimate the total number of tuples we need to process. <laughs> But again, one uh, very obvious uh, disadvantage of this is that, well, but first you have to generate the sample, right? You have to keep it somewhere as a, as a temporary table so that you reference it. But then another uh, obvious overhead you have to pay is that you, you sort of have to execute another mini query on this uh, sample table, right? Just to figure out, hey, how many tuples would satisfy my predicate in this sample table, right? You finish that query execution, and then you can use that in the uh, plan enumeration and plan search of the original query, right, to estimate the cost. So obviously this would be uh, more costly to do. But then the advantage is that you don't need to maintain all those uh, data structures we talked about earlier, right? So the, uh, now we talk about all these um, techniques, right, we can do to calculate the selectivity, now our two need to process, et cetera, et cetera, to feed in our cost model to calculate uh, our, uh, to calculate the cost to execute a particular query plan. Now I'm just going to talk about how we are actually going to uh, use this cost model in the plan search process, right, to figure out what would be the uh, better plan to execute a particular query. So before I dive into that, any uh, questions so far about the statistics and the tuple selectivity estimation, et cetera? or cost model, right? No question? Okay, cool. Then uh, for the remaining half an hour or so, we're going to talk about the uh, last piece of query optimization, which is to, to uh, search over alternative query plans and then use cost model to estimate their cost and then figure out what the best plan would be. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, generally uh, there are three, uh, well, three categories of uh, search that I uh, that we can roughly uh, group uh, this domain into. The first would be the search over uh, a query that is only operates on a single relation, right? So the uh, search for alternative plan there would actually be uh, uh, rather uh, straightforward. Uh, you can we can still use some uh, heuristics to uh, to uh, generate alternative query plan and then cost them and without a um, exhaustive uh, like a super complicated search framework, right? That's for a single relation. And then the second uh, category would be uh, called multiple relations, which is really, which means that uh, queries uh, with the joins involved, right? Whether it's like two way, three way, or multi or more way uh, of joins. So for that, we actually uh, typically need a uh, more uh, involved uh, search mechanism or principal search me mechanism to help us compare alternatives. Because uh, for those queries, the number of possible alternatives would just be uh, too big. If you do it naively, uh, you can, it, it can take forever. I can mention a number of the possible number of uh, plans for n way join, join, I think is uh, to fall to the power of n, right? It's actually exponential. And the last category is called the nested subqueries, which we uh, are not going to talk a lot here today, but I just want to mention that for this uh, third type of nested queries, what we usually do is actually what we talked about earlier, uh, like in, in the last class, we will actually typically look at First, whether we can expand the nested queries, right, to unroll it or flatten it to a join, and then we'll just treat it the same way as the second category, or we'll just uh, leave, I mean, if possible, we can also try to lift it up, right, to a separate query. Then we don't need to consider the nested queries uh, together either. And in the worst case, we just have to uh, exclude the inner query over and over again uh, for everything uh, from the uh, outer query. Right, but uh, that's, that's all we are going to cover or talk about the nested query today. So today we are going to more focus on the single relation as well as the uh, multiple relation, okay? So uh, first, like I mentioned, for the uh, single relation, the, the things to do there are, are not that complex, if you will, right? It's like some, oftentimes you can just use uh, simple rules or heuristics to generate alternative query plans as well. Uh, but note that the, uh, the Alternatives we are generating, or when I say simple heuristics, is actually different from the heuristics we talked about last time to generate a logical query optimization, to, to rewrite the query or open the query at a logical level, right? For, because last, in the last class, when we talk about logical query rewrite, the, uh, the rules will directly rewrite the query uh, without even considering the cost estimation, data property, et cetera, et cetera, right? Here, when we say we use simple heuristics to uh, search over different alternatives, we are generating alternatives using heuristics, but we are still going to cost it, 
right, using our cost model, and then compare the cost of alternatives instead of directly rewrite a query plan to a specific form. So in this uh, single relation case, uh, most of the time it's just a look at access method, actually, right, either whether you directly use a sequential scan, or sometimes you may use a binary search and say you have a clustered index on the relation, or I mean, if you have an index on the relation, of course, there's also the alternative of an index scan, right? So here, for single relation, our search process will just generate alternative query plans with these uh, different access methods. And there are some other things we can uh, play with here as well. Uh, for example, if you have uh, predicates with uh, multiple clauses uh, in a conjunction uh, predicate, then you can try to uh, play with the order of these uh, different predicates as well, right? So that you can filter out as most tuples as possible in the earlier evaluation of this predicate uh, rather than later. Right? But that's that's pretty much uh, you can you that's pretty much the, the more important thing uh, you can do uh, or you need to do uh, for a single relation or query. And usually, uh, these queries would come from uh, OLTP workloads, right? Where uh, you just uh, either just insert a tuple into the table or just look at a specific record or update it, right? Instead of a complex analytical query that would typically involve uh, multiple relations. <laughs> so, for these uh, simple queries, uh, especially uh, uh, single relational queries, show up in OLTP uh, workloads. That's actually a term for them, which is called a searchable, right? Which is an abbreviation of a search argument uh, able. Which, in other words, just means that uh, for these queries, usually there could be a uh, index that can help accelerate the uh, search of this query. Right? So, uh, um, like again, like a, a simple relational, a single relational query where you just look at, hey, what would be uh, the um, Will be the, uh, the, the, the people uh, in, the, in this data set that certify a particular age group, then if you build an index on the age group, uh, then this query would uh, very likely to be executed uh, in a very efficient way already, right? So that would be considered a, a searchable query, and it's not very uh, difficult to optimize uh, those queries and with the simple heuristics. Okay. <laughs> oh, uh, 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 actually, for these queries, uh, sometimes uh, uh, there could be a drawing queries that's still considered searchable, but again, uh, usually these are simple drawing queries that have a specific form, right? For example, you have a drawing query, but then it's just a two-way join where you have a, a foreign key constrained on the two tables, right? And in this case, and it, you can just use the uh, foreign key index to accelerate the uh, join of this query. And then this, are also, this is also very easy to optimize. Uh, and to generate uh, a, a good query plan for this query. So that would also be considered a uh, simple searchable query. Okay. Now here, yeah, there's like an example I talked about earlier. You stack star from this uh, table people where on a specific predicate, right? In this case it would be ID. And then you can just uh, directly use the primary index uh, to do the, to execute this query. Okay. Any uh, question on the single relational query or this uh, simple searchable query? Okay. <laughs> now they, we talk about get to the uh, more uh, complicated or advanced stuff here, right? What if you have a uh, multi relational query? So uh, in this case, the uh, most challenging thing I mean, you can think of, you can probably think of. Uh, in terms of figuring out what would be the good query plan for a multi relational query, it's just what would the join order should be, right? That's probably uh, the things that you have uh, mo mo the most alternative and then search space, make the search space big. Uh, and usually, I mean, the search space would be exponential, like I mentioned. So what we need to do here is that we first uh, need to restrict the search space a little bit, otherwise it's just going to uh, take forever. <laughs> so this actually goes back uh, to uh, the, the first, uh, first I mean, or at least one of the very first implementation of relational database system we talked about last, last class, which would be uh, the system R, right? So uh, in system R, again, uh, each person uh, take uh, one part of the uh, database system and trying to optimize it. And at that time, one important optimization decision they did in system R to reduce the search space of uh, multi relational query planning is to actually only consider the left deep join trees uh, in the uh, query, uh, in the query plan enumeration phase, uh, just to throw away all the like uh, right deep or bushy plans. I just only consider the left left deep tree, and that's just a, a, a assumption 
that they, they made at that time uh, to reduce the search space and to make the problem tractable. And interestingly, that assumption actually still carries today. I wouldn't say in, in all systems, but in, in many, many, I mean, temporary, uh, contemporary database system or modern database system, they actually still use the, the same assumption, right, to just to reduce the search space. And it actually turns out that in many cases, if you only consider the uh, left deep join tree, the, the query plan you, you, can, you can get at the end of the day is actually uh, I mean, pretty good or near optimal uh, if you compare it to what you consider all the, all the other uh, trees. Right? But of course, I mean, it's, it's a little bit heuristic way uh, to restrict the, the search space, but it just uh, turns out uh, to work reasonably well in practice, and many people are still doing it today. Okay, to uh, be a little bit more uh, specific about this, what do we mean by this left deep join tree? Would be that the join operation would only show up as the left child of each node in the tree, right? So which means that you, for every uh, operator in your plan tree, right, if it's a join operation, has the left relation and right relation, only the left relation would be allowed to have a result as, as another join result, right? For everything in, in the right uh, operand or the, the right child of a join uh, operation, they all have to be uh, a table itself, right? So in this case, the left uh, plan tree would satisfy uh, this property, but then now the other two uh, right trees would satisfy this property. Make sense? And that's just obviously, that would uh, I mean, restrict our search space to be uh, much smaller. So besides, I mean, we restrict the search space, there's actually uh, one uh, interesting uh, advantage that matters uh, more or more, that are like, that like, yeah, that matters more back then uh, than right now, which is that with this uh, left deep tree approach, it's actually uh, much easier to uh, pipeline the uh, query execution, which essentially means that while you are executing uh, this uh, a query with a multi-way join, you actually don't need to uh, materialize the uh, join result in a temporary table or write that back to the disk uh, during the join, right? Because every time when you have a join, the uh, temporary result coming out of a join operation will just be immediately, I mean, joined. If, if there are more joins, would just that temporary join result will just be immediately joined with another uh, uh, t base table, right? Compared to, for example, if we back to the earlier example here, right, if we look at the uh, rightmost picture, then if you want to perform that join, you actually have to, I mean, no matter which join you perform first, C or D or E or B, either way, after you perform one join, C, C, and D, you actually have to save the result somewhere, right? And then you go to perform the join on A and B. And finally, you can, I mean, merge the, or join the two join results back together, right? <laughs> so this matters more uh, back day because I mean, back in the day, the, the system don't really have a large amount of memory, right? So in the case that if you perform one join, uh, you have some uh, temporary join result, right, just for the two relation, but then if the join result is big, you actually have to write that back to the disk, right, to save it, and then you perform the other join. And then once that's done, you actually have to load the results from disk back to memory and then put them back together, right? So uh, again, if for modern systems, uh, this is, in some cases, or in many cases, this is not that big a concern anymore, uh, but in case the, the memory, uh, uh, the amount of available memory in your system is low, then with the left deep tree, it's also, it also has the advantage that uh, you don't have to materialize the temporary result of joint operations, so that you can just uh, pipeline all your uh, query execution. Make sense? Okay. <laughs> so uh, the uh, possible to, be a little bit specific about what would be the possible alternatives we can we need to think of in a multi-relational query planning. We talk a lot about the uh, query ordering, right? Uh, that's obviously one type of alternatives, right? Left, left deep tree one, through three, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then we talk about different uh, physical. Then we also need to you think about different uh, physical or like uh, algorithms that we would need to perform for each join operation, right? There will be either you can perform a hash join, sort merge join, a nested loop join, et cetera, et cetera, right? That's what we talk about, uh, I think, I believe earlier in the semester. No matter what order you choose for each join operation, you also need to choose a specific algorithm to finish that, right? And depending on the data property, I mean, different algorithms may be better. 
And lastly, in the uh, last level of your query plan, I mean, at the end of the day, you still need to read the data from, from your table, right? So of course, you, have to, you also need to uh, consider different alternatives of the access methods or access paths as well, right? Either it's index or a sequential scan. So in your multi-relational drawing query, uh, your multi-relational uh, query planning, you have to need to consider the alternatives of all of these um, elements. Right? So uh, to, uh, again, to reduce uh, to, or to make this search process uh, efficient, we are going to uh, leverage a technique called a dynamic programming, right, to help us to uh, perform this uh, query optimization process. And uh, I, I think many of you probably have uh, learned dynamic programming uh, in your, uh, I mean, either undergrad or like earlier algorithm classes, et cetera. Uh, but essentially, another, if you haven't heard of our term, another way to look at this is just that you are going to perform a memorized search, right? So you don't need to uh, search over uh, duplicate or to enumerate duplicated uh, query plans over and over again. You want to uh, reduce the number of uh, possible uh, possible uh, alternatives. You need to consider as much as possible, and also uh, trying to uh, remove the um, obvious uh, less optimal choices right, during your search process. So I will give you a specific example here. So he's, say here, <laughs> you have this uh, simple join query. It's like a join uh, over three relations with uh, I mean one predicate uh, on uh, relation uh, R and S, the other predicate on relation S and T. Right? <laughs> so here, I mean, you're just treating the, uh, I mean, a subset of the uh, possible nodes uh, in your search process or possible alternatives. And assuming that we are starting from the left, right, RST individually, we don't know who is going to join who first with what method, and then we are trying to, trying to figure out the best way to reach the uh, right side of this uh, slide, right? It would essentially be uh, the join result of the, of the three relations. And here I want to uh, mention that for all the nodes I'm joining here, I'm actually uh, joining them as a uh, relational algebra equivalent. Uh, you use them to represent the result uh, for the uh, equivalent queries under a relational algebra equivalence, right? So it's essentially the right node, R join S join T, is what we eventually want to figure out how do we perform the best, but it doesn't necessarily to be, I mean, the order as she showed up here, right? We're just trying to figure out what would be the best way to get the result, join the result of these relations. But it could be S join R first and then join T later, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, uh, we, or we use the same node to represent uh, this end result. Okay, so we start from the left. We don't know uh, what, I mean, order we are going to perform. So here, as you see here, there are two possible alternatives, right? I mean, because there are two different predicates, you can either uh, join R and S first, or you can join T and S first, right? So these are the join order alternatives. But furthermore, you can also have uh, different alternatives uh, to, uh, for, your, for your join algorithm, right? So here as the list, for each of these um, two choices to join which first, you can either use a hash join or sort merge join, right, for example. And then after that, you have, so here, for simplicity, I ignore the access path for now, right? But in actuality, there's also a choice of access methods. So here, we can just use uh, the uh, cost model we talked about earlier in the class, right? With the statistics, et cetera, to estimate the uh, tuple numbers. So we can estimate the cost of each of these um, operations so far, right? And then say, hey, this is the cost distribution. And then we just, at this point, right, since we are doing dynamic programming, we can all already eliminate the uh, less obvious, uh, oh, sorry, less optimal choices. I mean, for these states already, right? Because to reach the state, of, for example, to reach the upper state of R join S first, right, and then join T later, we don't need this other less optimal choice anymore, right? Because to reach that state, there are different choices, but then there's only one optimal choice, at least according to our cost mission, to reach that intermediate state, right? We, and we only need to save that. And after that, <laughs> it's, a, it's a similar thing, right? For each of the intermediate state, there are different ways uh, to reach the final state that we want to uh, optimize for. For the first one, I mean, you, you can uh, join, th join that result with T, but with different uh, algorithms. And for the second one, you can also uh, join that result with R with the different algorithms, and there are different costs. And eventually, uh, you are just going to, uh, again, first, 
only save uh, the optimal relatively uh, better cost for each of these um, access paths, and then after everything is done, right, you're just uh, going to look back from the final state and to see, hey, what would be the um, best way to work from to walk from start to end and to execute this query, right? That would just be to first uh, join TNS with hash join and then uh, join R later with a sort merge join. And then that would just eventually be the plan you pick. Here, assuming that you have enough budget to enumerate all these plans, right? So in the case that, uh, that you don't have enough budget, you just uh, cut it down earlier, cut the search process earlier, and then report the best plan you explored so far. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. It's actually a great question. Yeah, we, we are simplifying here. So here by, by state, I'm only like showing you which query has been joined so far, which has not. But in actuality, it's, it's actually much more complex than that. I also mentioned that, but, but yeah, I don't have a slide for that, but essentially for each of these intermediate state, it could also include the property of the tuples you get, right? So for example, here in the intermediate state, T join S first, right, and then join R later, you can also include whether uh, this intermediate state already have data sorted or not, right? And then you, that's one state, and then you have a different state with the data not sorted. And you have different ways to access those states with different costs, and then that will have different costs to transition to the final states, right? So, yeah. It's a great question. Okay. <laughs> so uh, to, uh, uh, is this, uh, to, to here I just gave you, I want to uh, show you the, it's the same example actually, but I just want to show it a little bit more uh, specifically right? to give you a little bit uh, better understanding. It's almost a, a reiterate uh, on what would be the factors we are going to consider in this join uh, enumeration. Again, the uh, first would be uh, the uh, different ordering of these uh, joins. The second would be the, what would be the algorithm choices, right, for, uh, for each of the join. And the last would be the, what is the access method you use, right? Uh, again, like, like I mentioned, I, I answered the question earlier, in, in actuality, I mean, there are, there are much more to consider and the actual search process involves uh, many more, involves many more elements in terms of the states. And then there are also uh, other mechanism to help you uh, either <clears throat> prune uh, less optimal uh, results earlier, or maybe a better generate, uh, uh, like a, to, to generate a better uh, query plans uh, easier, right? Uh, there, are, there are many more elements here. Actually, I think in, in some universities, uh, they actually have uh, the whole semester, a lecture of the whole semester to, to cover uh, query organization as a advanced uh, class, right, for in grad school. But here, I just have to uh, simplify things. But either way, I just show you a more concrete example, right? See, again, like our, our earlier example, drawing uh, three tables, I mean, there are, would first be a different possibility of the ordering of these uh, relations. And then here, I'm actually showing you the uh, Cartesian product on the right columns as well, because I'm mean, just showing you the uh, full, full space to consider, right? But in, in practice, and for example, uh, in, um, I think in system R, what they did is that uh, they were just directly uh, eliminated, eliminated these uh, possibilities uh, from the beginning, right? But that's just a choice. I mean, in, in theory, you could do it that way, right? But uh, in system R, they would just first eliminate these uh, possibilities uh, and then only consider, and of course also it will only consider uh, the uh, left, uh, deep, uh, left deep tree in its join order enumeration phrase, okay? And the next, we have uh, the uh, choices for to enumerate different join algorithms, right? Let's say uh, here, for example, we, we already have an order, right? I, R join S first, and then join T. Then it just have a lot of different choices, right? You either use nested loop join, hash join, and uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? like a nest, like uh, what's called a sort merge join. And then, uh, yeah, it's, you would enumerate the same thing uh, for every other plan, right? And eventually you pick the best possible one for this uh, particular order, right? Let's say it could be uh, this um, hash join in both cases. And lastly, right, for each join order, uh, uh, for each combination of the join order, as well as uh, that combined uh, the, all the choices of your join algorithms, you also need to choose the access path 
in your uh, lowest level of your plan tree, right, or your base table. So again, again, assuming that we fix that join order with the hash 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 join uh, for each join operation, we also need to uh, enumerate uh, different choices for sequential plan, sequential scan, index scan, or like just directly a, a search in the in the uh, your binary search if the table is clustered. Right? You also need to consider those alternatives and use your cost model uh, to cost each individual case and eventually uh, find the best one. All right, make sense? It's almost like a reiterate of what will be the possible choices you need to consider, okay? So uh, lastly, a very, uh, I have like, like roughly 10 minutes left, actually a very um, interesting example, if you will, of query optimizer I want to mention is actually uh, Postgres. Right. So uh, Postgres as a, I mean, you all know very well-known uh, 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 open source database system. I mean, in terms of open source system, it actually have a very uh, decent uh, query optimizer, right? It's commercial database system definitely would have much more uh, advanced uh, techniques to help query optimization. But in terms of open source system, Postgres optimizer is pretty good. And it, it, what it has is that, well, it actually uh, has interesting, it has uh, two different query optimizer implementations, right? So the first, it has the uh, canonical or traditional dynamic programming approach we talked about earlier, right? You look at a join order, look at uh, different um, uh, different uh, join algorithms, access paths, and you have a search process to enumerate different possibilities of them and then pick the best one, right? That's the canonical thing we talk about. Postgres has that. But another interesting thing it has is that it has something called a genetic, genetic uh, query optimizer, right? So what when it will use this optimizer is that when the number of relations is large, and in the, for the sake of Postgres, currently it consider 12 relations would be large, right? So under 12 relation, it would use the uh, traditional dynamic programming to enumerate different alternatives. But then if the number of relations uh, in your query is greater than 12, it will consider that, hey, I have just too many relations, right? They're just, the search space is just too big. No matter whatever uh, optimization we use in my um, search algorithm, it's just, at the end of the day, it's just going to cover a very small portion of the search space. And I'm very likely that the plan is not very good. So in that case, you actually seek to a different alternative uh, of query optimization. I mean, again, which is called a genetic, genetic query optimizer. And it actually utilized a randomized uh, optimization. It's almost kind of like a, a Monte Carlo simulation uh, to find a, a better query plan instead of enumerating the uh, search space. So, so let me uh, illustrate this, right? So, so what it does is that, again, instead of um, starting uh, the uh, search process, right, starting this uh, full dynamic programming uh, for different alternatives, it will actually uh, just start with a few uh, randomized order, as well as randomized, uh, randomly picked uh, drawing algorithm, as well as, I think access paths probably you can use heuristics to, heuristics to, uh, to choose better ones, right? But for drawing order or for the, uh, for the, um, Join algorithm, it will just start with some uh, randomized choices, right? In this case, it would be three, and in practice, it would be more. But uh, I mean, that's for illustration purpose, we're just going to look at the example of three. So once it has these uh, randomized uh, query plans, it will just, I mean, first, obviously, just cost it, right? Cost them. And then, I mean, because they are randomized, they may have a different, very different like, uh, cost, estimated cost. And then what we will do is that it will pick uh, the uh, best explored plan so far, right? Or record the best explored so far. In this case, it will be the last plan with cost 100. It will remove or throw away the uh, worst cost plans. Uh, in this case, it's just a one plan that is worst, but I mean, in practice, you can throw away the uh, uh, the plans with the, uh, with, with, throw away number of plans with uh, the, uh, the cost estimation that are highest. And then you keep the plans that have a medium cost and the or, or preferred or a little bit better cost as well as the best cost, you're just going to pick elements from these uh, plans, right? So either uh, this could be uh, the uh, drawing order or of some subtree of these query plans, or could also be uh, the uh, drawing algorithm specified on a specific uh, drawing um, operation. But essentially, at a high level, it would just pick the elements of the, from the query plan trees of the better plans uh, you have explored so far. And then do a random, com randomize the combination of those elements as, as well, right? To generate a second batch of randomized plan. 
And what we will do next? Oh, we'll actually initially do the same thing, right? It will cost the second batch of randomized plan generated from the elements of the first batch, right? From the better plans. And then again, record the best explored so far will be the first plan, throw away the worst plans, and then pick the elements from the better plans, and then so on and so forth to perform the third generation until the planning time budget is exhausted. So what, why is called genetic here, right? So essentially what this, this is doing is that it's kind of like a mimicking a evolution process of, of, of the genes, right? So for every batch, right, you just, uh, some of the bad genes, right, which is here would be the bad plants, will just be eliminated or thrown away, right? And then of course you record the best genes so far, but for the better genes, since, I mean, we don't really know, it's not a formal search process, right? We don't really know, hey, whether it's this Join order make this query plan very big, or whether it's a sorry, whether whether it's a join order to make this query plan very efficient, or maybe it's it's because of a specific choice of the join algorithm that makes the query plan very very efficient. We just don't know, right? We just know, hey, this plan seems good. So what we do is just like we just pick the elements of the genes from the survivor ones and then reorder them. Right, to combine them together, and also there will be a little bit of randomization, right? It's kind of like the uh, evolving process. And then eventually, uh, after batches and batches, or here it's called generations, after generations, hopefully uh, your gene can evolve to be uh, better and better, or even optimal, right? So that's how they deal with the case where the search space is too big. They just deem that the uh, normal uh, plan emulation and search process probably just are not going to generate or to enumerate a, lar a large enough portion of the search space. And so they just resolve this me randomized method to find um, potentially a better plan. All right, that makes sense? Okay, so uh, just to wrap this thing up, right? So uh, today we talk, uh, cover a lot about uh, query optimization. Right, so we first talk about uh, filtering. We, uh, I mean, this actually some of them is from the last class where we talk about uh, we always want to uh, push down the predicate as low as the uh, query plan tree as possible so that we can eliminate the unnecessary tuples as early as possible, right? In today's lecture, I also mentioned a little bit about when you are trying to uh, look at the predicates, estimate the selectivity of each clause in the predicate, you can also leverage that information to reorder the predicate a little bit so that you can evaluate a predicate with, as low, uh, with lower selectivity earlier uh, to filter out more tuples. Uh, in your, select, your predicate evaluation process, right? We talk about uh, how do we estimate uh, the uh, selectivity of uh, query plans. Uh, I mean, especially we talk about uh, three assumptions that we made to just make our lives easier, right? There will be a uniform uh, distribution, also different attributes are independent, as well as for joins, which is assumed that, uh, generally we just assume that the joins are uh, inclusive. And then we also talk about uh, the uh, alternatives uh, to, um, to cope with some of the assumption uh, that doesn't really satisfy in practice, right? For example, there could be a histogram, and there says uh, sketches. I didn't really um, wrote it here. I will also talk a little bit about how we uh, first calculate the joint selectivity. We also talk about um, how do we use uh, dynamic programming or this genetic method to explore different alternatives of the joint ordering uh, to eventually uh, generate better plan as the uh, or as the query optimization result. Again, uh, the last note I want to say that is, or emphasize again, uh, is that query optimization is pretty difficult. Like an earlier question mentioned in the class, there are actually many more properties in the plan enumeration and, and many more techniques to prune the search space to generate potentially better plans, etc. That uh, just uh, for the sake of time, in the scope of this class, that's just all we can cover uh, so far. All right. So uh, next class, we'll just uh, switch the topic to the transactions. So if the optimizer is arguably the most difficult part of the database system, then the transactions will be just be uh, arguably the second most uh, difficult part. All right, see you next week. Thank you. Uh, sorry, a great question? Oh, argue is, is like based in my opinion, right? The, the first, uh, the large, the, well, the most hard part of the algorithm is probably what we just talked about in these two weeks, query optimization, but even though there are many topics we, have, we haven't explored, right? Uh, but then the second difficult part is probably just uh, transactions, how to deal with uh, concurrent queries and make sure that uh, they can access the database uh, and get the results correctly.
ICK, talking about the St. Ives brew, run through a can or two, share with my crew is magnificent, plus it's mellow, and for the rest of the commercial, I pass the mic on to my no fellow. No need for a mic check, bust it, the fees are set, then grab a 40, to flim the yoke and snap his neck, St. Ives, take a sip, then wipe your lips, cue my 40's getting warm, I'm out, he got the dip, drink it, drink it, drink it, then I burp, after I slurp, ice cube, I put in much work, with the BMT and the E-Trouble, get us a St. Ives brew on the double. 